You're listening to The Adventuring Party, discussing tabletop and related gaming, and the Irish gaming scene, so you don't have to. And welcome to the party. I'm Savage. I'm Shane. And I'm Owen. And joining us today, representing the new blood of the Irish gaming scene, young Turks with bold new ideas, or otherwise known as contemporaries of myself, we've got Baz and Colin. Excellent. Welcome to the party, guys. Very glad to have you on. Uh, this, I think it's the first time appearing for both of you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, and we're, uh, we're recording in, uh, in a wintry mountain lodge on the estates of, of, uh, of, of the, the year. Wild winter wastes of Cabra. Yeah, we're, it's just turned December. Such a lovely warm fire here. We're, all, we're, we're wrapped up in it, uh, but we're about to, uh, to warm the cockles of our and hopefully your hearts with some hot takes on uh, current gaming news. Hopefully you're going to be hearing this episode in uh, just a few days, really. Hopefully. So this is uh, this is as spicy as it comes. So let's uh, let's get cracking and, and mull some uh, some opinions mm. uh, and see what we come up with. So well, honestly, the temperature reminds me of the origins of the phrase "brass monkeys." Brass. It's it's not that bad just yet. No, no and, it's fine. Uh, no. And I, I've. A few blowhards like ourselves will bring the temperature up really Absolutely. quickly. Absolutely, <laughs> we'll fill this room with CO2. Um, so. Also, I think the, uh, if we're talking about uh, timeliness of news, I think the big uh, the big news point right now is that Cubicle 7, RPG manufacturers and current publishers of the Wolfrup uh, RPG, have lost their license for their other big... Um, the other big RPG, the One Ring and uh, Adventures for, Mid- for Middle Earth. You stole my bit. You absolute cur. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to do a whole bunch of random D&D stuff. Yeah, but that they was didn't <laughs> lose the license. They chose to drop it in response to presumably a bunch of changes uh, that came up that the licensor attempted to force on them because they were just about to release their game. Was that change that they'd pay more money? I, I would assume that with the Amazon series coming out they were like, let's raise the rates, uh, and uh, they they think, or maybe some like people express an interest. Possibly, uh, I always I always think about Hasbro or FFG about a time like this. Mm. Yeah, and they've, FFG are already publishing a couple of. Yeah, someone had their hand out looking to get paid. Essentially, uh, I, would, I would not be shocked. No, would not be shocked. Is I mean, is it a popular enough game to, for people to be worried about I'm just thinking of uh, uh, recently the uh, Iron, Ireland's premier gaming convention Gelcon where Cubicle 7 had two tables one lined with uh, Woofrup stuff and one absolutely creaking under Doctor Who and uh, uh, One Ring Adventure for Middle Earth stuff and I was just you know, that is actually a very large chunk of their portfolio that they've just had to drop and see I wonder about uh, the, the wisdom sometimes of adopting one of these licenses for uh, for these systems like you you're always having to go back to the license holder and say well you know can we do this can we do that and as Owen says the money goes up if you're successful they want more and that can make the whole endeavour a little unsustainable sure. But we've, had, at, we've had a lot of these things get pulled from different companies in the last year, haven't we? At the same time, um, a, val- a license like Lord of the Rings is super valuable. People will buy that stuff just because of the setting. That's why you get the license in the first place. Um, and it saves a ton on work. <laughs> J.R.R. Tolkien has done all the work. Yeah, the yeah. setting is there. The depth is there. Quick all you've got to do... Put this uh, back end together. <laughs> all you've got to do is... Um, is plug in your story and your mechanics and... Oh, no, no, wait, hold on there. Because you plug in your story, then you have to uh, go back to the licensee to... Or licensor to double-check that everything's in order and make sure they want to make any changes. Oh, for published scenarios. And yeah, 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 so there, there can be a lot of extra work involved on that True. side of things. Um, but if if it's not Cubicle 7 it's going to be someone else publishing that RPG well, there's always going to be a, a feed for it so it, like th- these licenses are popular for a reason because we will pay money to buy them they actually had two Middle Earth RPGs one of them was the One Ring the other one was Middle Earth Adventures I think yeah. which is a fifth ed skin so mm-hmm. it's a fifth ed uh, it's fifth ed skin for Middle Earth just whatever you feel about how appropriate that is for Middle Earth uh that was the skin that was there that was but really no no but like just in terms of the no I understand that seven. but yeah it was quite popular. but the really interesting interesting one for me is they off, they also have uh, Wolf Up the license which is really cool 
And I thought that was actually, that's great because GW aren't using Wolfrop at the moment. So they won't super care about what, what the licensor does with the setting, except GW have just announced they're bringing back <laughs> Wolfrop the old world as a minis game. Oh yeah, oh, it's it's all so over the place. They might start, I, I can't wait to see what edicts well, come down well, from Wolfrop. On. You know, Games Workshop have announced that they have a logo. For something yes. that will turn up in two years. Yes. So we still have no idea what that's going to be. Oh, we have no idea what it's well, going to be like. we have some idea. We know that it is the old world. Yeah. We know it has square bases. Yes. Yeah. That's it. So it's... it's. We don't even know the scale. Some people have been talking about maybe it's going to be Warmaster. <laughs> Unlikely. No. But, no. but from the details that we have, who knows? Maybe they'll time shift and get <clears throat> Warhammer of the Old Republic. Well, no, because they're going to have to find whoa, a way to squeeze whoa, whoa. in the submarines. <laughs> And, uh, of squeeze course. in the signings of the setting but you know like, think about Colin's it they're going to they're gonna want all the minis to do double duty so they're going to be like hey, they, no they, they don't they, not necessarily <laughs> they, they want the players to do double duty on their wallet so I you think need to buy two separate it's, sets if you're listening to this and you're worried about these developments I think it's important now that you start learning how to magnetise all your models absolutely and square <laughs> Magnet- and round bases magnetise your bases that's going to be, like, be the next hot topic on the subject of licensors very briefly the doom of the old James Bond RPG was there was one guy who did licensing for James Bond products and he would get sent stuff like here's a 300 page book on Smirsh read through that and make sure everything's accurate or things like dude I approve lunch boxes. <laughs> Why are we doing this? And he basically went up the upper and said, you've got to start charging these guys 50 times as much because it's 50 times as much work as anything else. I look at the lunch box. Does James Bond have his pants on? Yes. <laughs> Inaccurate, but appropriate for kids. <laughs> you know? And that was it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll move on from, from the licensing woes of, of publishers and developers. Baz, do you have anything for us this week? Um, not that much. I mean, a lot of the games I play are fantasy flight games ones. Um, so I think some of the recent releases out of that is obviously it's got the new Keyforge set out, which is is that still a thing? We've we've talked about Keyforge before before on the show. Yeah. So um, it's still going. It yep. still seems to be going strong. I have seen um, purchasers show hotel rooms basically stuffed with them. Oh, uh, there was a bit of a kerfuffle when uh, Target got the stock early and released it early. Which is like, okay, that's bad, but Target's pretty big. You're not too concerned about that. And then FFG restocked Target and then told the local game shop, some of them, that, oh, we don't have enough stock for you guys yet. Yeah. So Target that was, that was a well, bit controversial. Is, it, yeah, just, yeah, is yeah. it just a few but, big whales that are buying all of the stock or is, are people still... Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I think there are people who still you know will buy a pack or two because it's good fun, but... Uh, competitive players seem to be spending a couple of grand in consortiums to to get the top deck. And where so uh, where are the speculators on this? I know in the initial flush of the game there, there were decks going for a couple kind of hundred. Of Ten to twenty heavy speculators. I'm talking yeah. about people who dropped between two to fifteen grand on decks. Yikes. Either buying drifts of decks or other stuff and one guy was I know apparently was like was in for 15 grand and said oh my god I'm going crazy doing this and sold everything he had and made about 12 grand and he kind of came out of that going okay that was a loss but that was not a ridiculous loss because he'd been he was working a well paying job and he was like I just did all this stuff I just every time I'd be stressed I'd go online and look through uh, <laughs> eBay and buy a, buy a couple of a cool looking uh, keyboard stack and he sold that on and then the team that bought it as a consortium then won a bunch of major events with the decks his deck library right well I think one of the big surprises for the developers um, I think it was Rachel Trimble was one of the successful players mm-hmm. um, she basically won a big event I think what they'd originally expected was people would go in win this big event and then they'd have this amazing deck and then they'd sell it but she didn't so people basically play the decks I think they get attached to the decks maybe they enjoy them they don't sell them on which I think originally was a, an assumption that the designers had that there would be there would be a cost associated with the decks so successful decks would get sold on and the name would be but that doesn't seem to be happening I can't imagine that was Garfield's plan I can imagine right. it being FFG's plan yeah. it's funny those, that those plans was, diverged yeah, yeah it was funny he was he was more correct about people having their own deck that they liked Yes, well, I mean, the, but the the thing for him was he was like, well, magic was a terrible mistake. You know, we never expected people to spend all of this money, uh, but they did, and they kind of ruined the game a little bit. But this way, you can't do that because you can't go out and buy those rare cards. 
Yeah. Meanwhile, Just players go ahead and buy rare decks. Yeah, they've, so. they've essentially, instead of I will build a collection of cards and build decks from us, it, it's I'm building collections of decks. Yeah. And picking the appropriate deck. I'll be very interested to see if anyone picks up on that sort of design philosophy in the same way that uh, legacy games took off in the last couple of years. Like, Keyforge does point to another way to put together a, co- a collectible card game. It plays well on the table, and it those decks, when you learn how your deck works, you've got a pretty good shot of winning mm. with almost anything. But will other <laughs> other if developers sort of look at this and go, oh, we could we could try some of these ideas? Very technically demanding what they did with the printing. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Very you would need either someone in China to steal you the tech, or uh, which happens they'd in China never, all the time. Never do, oh, they'd never you know, ever do that with the. The copy factories. IP wholesale. law doesn't exist over there. Uh, whereas it's more of a guideline. You know, you flourishing about it. Pete, there are companies that could put the money in and do it, but there's not there's not a lot of companies that could put the money but, in and do it. But even then, like it still hasn't been nailed down. Uh, there been a there was a couple of areas where people bought boxes and never got one of the five or six factions. All of the decks, none of them had oh, it. Wow. And other ones, all of the decks had one particular faction. So <laughs> there there had been some distribution problems. I think they've largely tracked it down and sorted it out but like it's a really challenging product instead of randomizing um, but I mean they're they're still heavily supporting it it seems to be incredibly popular for them um, interesting obviously there's a, a lot of other FFG games where like my, my particular focus is on Legend of the Five Rings uh, which is still going strong um, and you know RPG books are coming out and they're, they're constantly churning out the content so uh, yeah I mean they always have stuff it's always good including going deeper into the Ivory Kingdoms in the Ronan book than it's ever been done before. That was surprising, yeah. yeah. So mm. we're, we're beginning to see some of the other nations, so mm. Indian-inspired nation is a big feature in there. Oh, these are Rokugan adjacent places in the yeah. fiction. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. All right. so it's Bring a, on the war elephants. Yeah. The Ivory Kingdoms is Indian-ish in the same way as uh, Rokugan is Japan and China-ish. But not exactly. Yeah. Well, not exactly. A bit of Korea. Not, not exactly, yeah. Inspired. Inspired, you know, inspired, yeah. inspired certainly. You know, uh, evokes the ethos of or whatever. We won't talk about uh, cultural appropriation it's a, a rabbit hole I'm, <laughs> I've, I've had to dig my way out of many a time um, and yet to catch a rabbit but uh, is there anything else on the horizon for, for you Owen anything that's absolutely up? been keeping an eye on I've been watching with interest the release of the remastered Enemy Within from Cubicle 7 again they have gotten out the first two books of it at this stage uh, Shadows Over Broken Half and Slash The Enemy Within Slash Mistaken Identity have been repackaged into one book as Empire and Shadows and they've also produced an Empire and Shadows companion which is here's like 20 NPCs your players could encounter here's some roadmaps here's a little bit about the political situation in the Empire here's three adventures at the back drawn from different books in the past it's a grab bag of extra tools for a GM and I will say it's, it's actually a marvellous set of extra bits of information I've been running the first part of the uh, Enemy in Shadows and they've got a load of really clever things like every location major location in Boganaf and then they expand out to about 30 40 locations every location has two plot hooks on it things that are going on so if the players just wander into a place you can look up and go actually yep there's that there's that there's that and I've had to do very little they go okay we want to find a smith and I'm like okay hang on I didn't think of a name of a smith. No, I don't. I deflect the smith location and go, these are the current smith guys. And I've just got the, the companion just came out. So I was like, oh, here's a bunch of extra stuff. Here's a, a, dis, a disgraced uh, dwarven smith on the run from his family who wanted him to turn him into a slayer. And he's like, you know, I I did not know my father. I am not responsible for whatever he got up to. The family shame. I am not shaving my head and getting myself killed <laughs> because my father was a jerk. Yeah. I am not doing it. So all of a sudden, a simple trip to the smiths has turned into another Exactly. It's just, it's, it's more stuff. They've got a great grouch show marks uh, uh, XB in it which I'm going to have a lot of fun running they've uh, they've maintained their sort of two book approach for the Empire or the Enemy Within campaign yes they? so they're going to be putting a 10 in total plus a comp- another compilation of adventures plus a compendium of some sort they've said and they've also made illusions about a magic book and a religion book and I don't know how they're going to print all this stuff if they get the enemy within out and we actually get a good part four and five of that I'm happy and I can close the book on the thing I'm terrified of how much they're over promising that's the, my, my biggest concern with them they the laid moment. out a lot of roadmap didn't they they said yes. they're doing an awful lot of stuff and it's almost all adventures 
Right. But they sell. Or support. They do, well, no, they don't. Typically, adventures sell to a GM, and that's kind of it. Yeah. Oh, true. Uh, players don't buy adventures. They might buy, might buy a player book. Unlikely, but they might buy a player book. Um, you're, you, you sell to GMs, but you don't sell hugely well. To, like, you know, you sell... It's fine. But but arguably a great adventure will then drive those players to pick up all of the other books they need to play in those games. Hopefully. Um, and it's such a big legacy adventure. It's like one of the three great old campaigns. So, Yeah, we were talking before the show about how it basically defined how people yeah. interact with the game and how they treat it differently from D&D, sort of vanilla, or any of the other sort of high fantasy games out there. Exactly. Uh, what are you worth exploring in a later episode, I think. What are the other two? I would say the, uh, Pendragon and something Masks and Arthur opened up in the Great Pendragon campaign oh, are seen as the classic three. If I was running Pendragon, I'd be super tempted to run a battle deck. <laughs> that would <laughs> well, be awesome. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. ponder that for just as long as it takes for, uh, for Colin to tell us. Oh, can we get into this campaign? Because I, I, I'm, all about, <laughs> I'm all about playing a knight and a giant robot. Mm hmm. Heavy cavalry. <laughs> um, what's on my radar? I have been mostly paying attention to um, its end of year new stuff season over at Games Workshop. Um, so we have just had the very, very, very long awaited release of Plastic Sisters of Battle. Um, and when I say very, I mean, people have been asking for these for, I think, 20 something years it's people who invented the hobby who <laughs> weren't around for the um, first round of calls so that, that set came out it's a huge big box of plastic it looks like a great way to get started and uh, it also looks like Games Workshop went really really hard on the um, artificial limitations on how many are actually going to be available the set the pre-orders sold out within three minutes on every website on the planet um I believe the entire Asia region got zero stock. Ooh. And oh within an hour of Games Workshop selling out on their own websites, um, the pre-orders were on eBay with three 400% markups. Mm. So, sisters are here, but you probably didn't get them. <laughs> <laughs> not cheap to get in on the nuns with guns, no? No, not, not yet, yeah. anyway. Now, they're... Um, January they're scheduled to have more releases the individual boxes will start coming then and there'll be multi-pose kits rather than the single pose mm. that are in this big starter box um, but yeah the uh, the sisters have arrived um, with a bit of fanfare a bit of controversy uh, and oh, we'll see how oh they my, get on oh my god the victory of St. Catherine as well looks absolutely the, amazing it is it's a beautiful centerpiece diorama type affair that you I, I think it has some function on a battlefield as well <laughs> one would have said blocks line of sight um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a marvellous looking thing and I highly suggest you jump on the GW site and, and have a look at it did you see the Mechanicus Ornithopter yeah, yes. that oh, it's really cool. <laughs> I just looked at that and went, ah, Frank Herbert's still having a profound influence on these hack yes, frauds. I mean, there are many, many complaints one can level at Games Workshop, but the quality of the models that they put out and consistently is is just hard to argue with. Yeah. Um, they've got lots of other things coming out. It is pushing towards the end of the year, so uh, this is when we get the annual up or the yearly updates, which this time around is including chapter approved for 40k it's including annuals for kill team and Warcry. um that's what it. else is that it that's it yeah. there's a new format for uh, i think chapter approved and the Warcry annual where it's not one book it is two separate books which at first people were raising eyebrows and going what's going on here they're being sold as a double pack so it's not you have to it's not that where we once were going to sell you one book we're now selling you two it's now you buy your your update annual pack and it just happens to be in two separate volumes to keep the two separate systems that it's updating. Is so that, that, that's just for the 40k, it's not for Warcry. Warcry is the brand new release, we've no idea what's in it yet. Oh, okay. The update. Yeah. Um, so do you, can you buy one or the other? Do you no, know? it's a twin pack. So oh, it's, okay. they're, they're packed together. Two volumes. Um, and one has all of your points updates and data sheet updates, and the other has... Is this the long-awaited for Death of the Codex? Is this no, one? no. Th no th this has been happening for a while. Um, yeah. The... The annual uh, codex release has been a thing for Games Workshop, and um, 
it is effectively you have to pay them to patch the game that you're playing, which is uh, less than ideal in many people's eyes, but um, uh-huh. it, it is how it's going. They, they so, release patch stuff um, in, uh, in our plastic So the Warcry games. one isn't out yet. No. Codex Astartes, the, that's the 40k one, is out, I think. Um, or, oh, well, we people have got their hands on them. But yeah, I think the review copies have their have hands on it. And then is. the Kill Team one, the very earliest preview videos are going up like today, yesterday. Um, but the release is not for another week or so. Um, initial impressions of what's in the Kill Team one from those of us who really, really like Kill Team are not great. It looks, it's got some new stuff. It's also a two hundred page book that is priced fairly low it's being aimed at 25 euro i believe um but it looks like a lot of lazy copy pasting and not the kind of updates and revisions that people were looking for Uh, how long do these books kind of remain relevant in the in the cycle of the game so they're they're i think on an annual release schedule they are an annual release schedule and um, because they've got points values in them like the real point of these is to let uh, games workshop tweak the model points so if something's a bit too strong they can up the points something's a bit too weak they can reduce the points so every year those points are going to be completely negated but the other half of that are they like have scenarios that you can play through they've got kind of cool feature stuff they've got open play parts that you're not going to have in the competitive scene but are kind of fun ways to re different ways to look at the game and kind of play the game and do things so you know an annual from two three years ago will have some pretty good content that you'll have some great it's nights playing easy, yeah. yeah yeah but you'll you'll miss out on the point yeah, they sound like good stocking stuffers in the, the run-up to christmas for those where we yeah. actually take a, a break from some gaming so you can sit down Reevaluate your <laughs> your team lists or your your army yep. lists and, and Re- go again. And realize game. you need to go buy more models. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who knew? <laughs> the GW product I want to buy that I can't is Blitz Bowl. Um, Blitz Bowl. Ah. Blitz Bowl is an alternate iteration of Blood Bowl that has been sold in America and parts of Germany. Yeah. Um. It is a different. Se- it is a different set of rules. Different game. Uh, set in the Blood Bowl universe using some Blood Bowl equivalent stuff because I find Blood Bowl a very difficult game to play because it's entirely about risk management and I'm like oh well, I'm just really unlucky at times I hate being I think you've been making mistakes of playing people like Colin when really you should be playing people like me then the risk management doesn't matter because I'm terrible at the game yeah, do it really it's improves not, your experience and it's also like you know the, the best way to play the game if you ever look at the like the meta is fairly well established at this point it's toxic. Okay. Like it's very. It, it's a really good game, but it's not. But it's is toxic. Well, I feel like we're opening up yeah. another episode right there. But what I will ask is: Is Blitz Bowl any different from Blood Bowl? Is it played in a grid? Is it played like basically on a, six a, a side? I think six a side, match? smaller grid, and there's you're not trying to score. Like you've got cards, you need to score. I. I want to hear more about it, but the problem but, is it's sold in Target in America. No, Barnes and, so, and Noble. Barnes, oh, Barnes and Noble. Noble in America. Right. So getting them ship over here isn't uh, you know, yeah, never going to happen. And they've, they've done a few lines of this. And it's arguably quite clever um, because they're perfect kind of stocking stuffers or yeah. introduction ones. They've done one with... Um, Warm Warm Underworlds. Warm Underworlds. But they, they brought out the rules for that and the models over here. Yeah, but they cost the same price. Yeah. Um, but you don't get all the extras like the little boards. Anyway, we won't go into that. Uh, they, they've also brought out... Um, uh, 40k adventures I think it is where you get like three or four space marines that are in different colours and then you go through a dungeon killing stuff so it's oh, the perfect kind of, space crusade it's basic it's it's the perfect kind of thing to, to give a kid well, and long been wondering get them gonna, introduced oh, that, that should be everywhere like that's those are the games that really got me into yeah. the hobby yeah. uh, Hero Quest and Space Crusade and the fact that there isn't something that is that gateway now I'm glad to hear that they've got something like that, but only in Barnes and Noble yeah. in the states. Yeah, the, on, their, the leash on that one. Their completely. local releases seems to be a, a thing that they've been doing the past couple of years, and it is only just a couple of years. The, I know that one of the releases they have are these Space Marine Heroes, which is a. Uh, they're blind boxes. They're effectively boosters, which will contain one of a range of oh boy. these space marine models. <laughs> and they're they're it's, it's they're not. I don't think the models are effectively unique or anything. You can get them in other sources for some of them, maybe. They were some unique originally, were they? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I know that that was originally only released in Japan. Yeah. 
which was markets specific. Like, nobody saw that one yeah. coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes. I'd, I'd, the models are like they're monopose, but they're really good monopose. And yeah, people people were getting them shipped. People were buying them from Japan and getting them shipped all over the world so they could yeah. get their hands on them. Got to gotta have them all. Say so we get all your uh, super deformed Gundams. <laughs> well, I mean that's that's a tough market for GW to go in because they're going up against uh, the Gunpla models and they're amazing. They're like ridiculous. Uh, multi like multi pose kits to assemble, snap together, no glue, no nothing. It's like um, what kind of genres or lines are they? It's Gundam primarily, but any of the mobile suits, any of the mobile suit or mech stuff, uh, they will do those sorts of models for, it. and they're crazy. They're like you should look at them. They're ridiculous. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a Gundam yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, guy. Yeah, well, yeah, they're good. Uh, you can get some in certain stores in Dublin. They're a really good uh, way to pass some evenings uh, putting them together, but they're not really gaming uh, although I have seen attempts to for by people to, to gamify their gunplay collection but um, it's an interesting route for GW to go but they, yeah. they do they do set a, a model baseline that I think is maybe difficult for GW to, to lock into because mm-hmm. as far as I'm aware those Gundam models are extremely detailed and very yeah. They're not only detailed as a base thing, they are very customizable. There are, there's a kind of secondary market of like special markers and paints and transfers to, and all kinds of add-on bits and oh, bits. Oh, I see you coming. I've, yeah. I've looked at some of that stuff. It's, oh, yeah. But then I very mean, expensive if Games Workshop wants to basically push the same style of hobby but they're trying to break into that already pre-existing market over in uh, Japan. It's tough. Tricky. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, I think it was clever of them to try what they did, and it seems to have been successful, and uh, we're, we're at least happy to see it over here. Yeah. Well, if you're so moving on to... I've got a bit of news, as it happens. One oh. that Shane hasn't gotten his grubby Ooh. bits on. Stop looking at my notes, Shane. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have... Obviously, I'm running a, a fifth date game, so I'm, I'm on the scout for anything that makes my life a little easier, and I often find that there's plenty of plug-and-play stuff available for very cheap. Uh, the Humble Bundle guys have been throwing out decent bundles this last while and they have a they have an Orcus 5-Ed holiday horde at the moment that's packed with an interesting array of crossover stuff from the likes of I'll just consult my notes here uh, Frog God Games Cobalt Press and Troll Lord uh, mm. games who might be familiar to some of you those guys have been around since the 3.0 days they, they have yeah and that's that's kind of where this catches me because it's all fifth ed material, yeah. but it's all being presented in this kind of second ed or two point five yeah. style. So classic got their, gamer style. They've always classic stuff and classic themes. You know, sort of the the keep on in the borderlands or the the lords of the tar pits, and there's these nice sort of 20, 30 pages of stuff that you can drop into your campaign, and it gives some it's some real old school lovely ideas with the new systems yeah. fully started. Yeah, Frog God Games in particular are, are known for their OSR, sort of having a uh, foot in both graves, as were, of the OSR and the fifth and the latest D&D stuff, uh, always ready to go, and it's kind of cross-compatibility between the two sensibilities. Yeah, that, so... If how you, the expression goes? Foot in both graves? Foot in both graves. That sounds like some, some parts of the hobby sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> a foot in both Maybe camps. for a necromancer. Mm-hmm. Foot in both camps, or, or uh, yeah, one foot in the grave. I like... But we're, you heard it here first. A foot in both graves. <laughs> not, not really pleasing anybody. <laughs> um, they ha- so they had that bundle. I mean, you could drop a dollar and get some really nice stuff. They've got, a, they've got an interesting couple of uh, settings which is the other thing I sometimes struggle with, thinking of a cool place for players to go. But you just open up one of these and you've got, oh, it's a it's a plane full of tar pits. Well, that's interesting. Or it's a, a forest so dense that the, the sunlight never hits the ground, so it's, it's just full of nocturnal oh, creatures cool. and, and monsters all the time. That's just something I'd, well, I'd like to see more of. Is We talk about blind bags for models, but I'd sort of want, want to... to see any more of those. No, <laughs> no, we don't like those. Yeah, but... A five-year-old is about to come into knowledge of these things. Kinder eggs are bad enough. <laughs> You've um, already got a source of randomness in who your GM is. You don't need a source of randomness about what your scenario is as well. Uh, I don't know. Let's see what we got in the bag. Oh, I kind of like to surprise myself. I, 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 I'm not saying that, you know, uh, buy it today, run it tonight thing, but I do like the idea of, like, a random it collection. Of... <laughs> <laughs> Go on, though. It has, um, it has a, of a, uh, a random inspiration role, Absolutely, essentially. Yeah. Like, as in, you know, even if it was just, like, an add-on, like buy 10 euros get one of our random pdfs for free uh would be would be an interesting thing to have as a, a thing to try uh, well I, I know some sales days you get those sorts of offers here and there on drive through rpg but like we're talking 
yeah, drop 10 on other products and we'll you give you a freebie. But the Humble Bundle stuff usually starts at a, a dollar or mm -hmm. some, yeah. about 91 cent for, for European listeners. Yeah. Um, I don't know who, I don't know what, what do they use in Kurdistan, where I believe we've got a, a couple of devote followers as well. I'm afraid I, I cannot, uh, <laughs> couldn't comment the on that. The stats don't lie, folks. <laughs> um, they also, they're running a Pathfinder comics bundle at the moment. A Pathfinder just went second ed. Yes. Yeah. Just sort of, in the sort of six months ago, just. Yeah, and have been quite successful and have done, or just did a play test for the four new classes that are coming out of Gen Con this yeah. year, or next year. So they're pushing a bundle of the old comics, uh, some of the old scenarios, and a whole bunch of the first ed material which yeah. I'm is there any sort of conversion uh, you matrix can, you can converting the scenarios is relatively straightforward their plan is to get the second beast year out at the start of next year and at that point the two beasts will cover 90 ish percent of all of the monsters that you get in any of their adventure paths then the custom guys the kind of unique monsters you might face like this bad guy or that bad guy you'll have to make them up yourself but it means that if you're coming out you can actually go I'm going to run um, like Wrath the Righteous in uh, in basically in second ed and it's not too bad people have converted them on the fly or just like yeah we're just running this and converting it and they've got Kingmaker as a conversion coming into second ed but their other adventure paths are not going to convert they're just going to be like you can run so this is, you is, need to do a little bit of work is that Kingmaker conversion going to get Printed like it was a Kickstarter, as I recall. Yeah, one of the printed. So it's due to come out. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. It's a. Oh, I think it was. It, it's one of the third party guys. I'm not sure if it's Frog God, or if somebody else is, is doing their thing. Uh. So yeah, I mean, like, the, it, there's value in them. Some of them are like depending on what adventure paths are there. Some of them are very good depending on what adventures they're there. Some of them are very good. The comics. I read some of the comics. They're grand. They're not like neither. You know. Neither super bad nor super good. It might Neither. give you a bit of artwork to show your player yeah. or something. Absolutely. Else. There's some entertaining stuff if you like the iconics, which are basically they're the the sure. kind of poster child characters for the class. Yeah. They're all in it and you get some insight into how much of a jerk the Magus is or uh, <laughs> how much of a nutter the uh, the orc war priest is. You but know? a lot of the, the content on that particular bundle is content free to an extent. Like once you get into some of the books, like it's it's recommending how to run the games and things mm. you can do and like obviously the mechanics aren't going to tie up but if you've already got through the limited amount of uh, Pathfinder second ed material that's in there there's tons more to read that would help a GMA yeah. game and there's always it always helps to have a little bit more and because Pathfinder had such a, a long run of adventures mm. in its first edition um, it was going back to 3.5 when they, they started out isn't it yeah yep. uh, I still have some of those on the shelves and you can still pull them down and find some great ideas um, that's pretty much it I think just on, on 5th oh, yeah. Ed did you manage to get your copy of uh, the new Hebron book I, I don't know what you're talking about okay but, uh, All right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't follow any of that sort of thing anymore well, uh, that's, a, that's a different time you're, you're clean now <laughs> it's fantastic I, you know what guys you know what Everon left me I, oh no. I, 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 I was I remained faithful Everon left me uh, I just I'd like, I'd like I, I don't blame you Rich <laughs> Rich, uh, you wrote a you wrote a great game, and, and they just you mean Keith Baker as Keith opposed Baker. to Rich Baker, who's a completely different person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even yeah. Adam Guest. <laughs> I'm sorry, both Bakers. <laughs> um, I think that's probably as, as good a place to wrap this episode up as any. Uh, thank you, Baz. Thank you, Colin, for coming on and sharing some stuff. We're probably going to have you on at a later date. Uh, so if you if you kind of we we probably do something in your wheelhouse now which there are several of yeah, we'll have to so, check if we're going to be available for that though uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff we've talked about this week uh, you should be hearing this on what the 3rd the 3rd the 5th the of December uh, those humble bundles probably have another week to run at this point but uh, keep your eye open uh, there's always some good stuff appearing there the uh, Edge Tab Day are also running some indie RPG uh, game bundles if you're involved in that uh, even more obscure end of the copy see I knew you had your own news <laughs> just waiting for the last moment anyways we'll put links to most of what we've talked about today in the show notes uh, get hold of us on social media follow us on twitter uh, hit us up on facebook uh, lo what is it like like comment and subscribe uh, and we will see you next time on the adventuring party but until, until then this party's over Thanks for listening to The Adventuring Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. 
You can leave comments there or on Twitter through at AdventuringPTY. The hosts can be contacted by email at party at theadventuringparty.net. The Adventuring Party is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike Version 3 License. should stop at this point great ah, thank you very much guys that's uh the shirt stopped no but i'm trying to capture some stuff that we can use in the background <laughs> so we already had our thing we, i got rid of all of those oh shane <laughs> now i'll stop <laughs> <laughs>